passengers, pilots and planes still stranded. Despite air traffic control faults being fixed, many are facing days of delays and cancellations. We actually got married on Sunday, so this is our honeymoon. So it wasn't meant to go like this. It just said that basically the holiday's been cancelled, go home. I try to get a hotel, but obviously they're all booked up. Also this lunchtime, pressure growing on the Spanish football chief to resign after he kissed a player at the World Cup final. He shouldn't be in the job anymore, I think, for the mistake that he's made. And now something like that has overshadowed how well the Spanish national team have done. They've just won a World Cup. Plus, the government criticised for diluting pollution rules to make way for more new homes. And the forgetful woman who had an eight centimetre worm living in her brain, we hear from the neurosurgeon who found it. I took my tweezers or my tumour holding forceps and I pulled it out and I thought, gosh, what is that? It's moving, take it out of my hands. This is the ITV Lunchtime News with Kylie Pentelo. Good afternoon. Now, the initial problem may have been sorted, but still there are thousands of people delayed and stranded at airports this lunchtime after the UK's air traffic control system went down. Significant disruption is expected to last for days with pilots and planes in the wrong place. In a moment, we'll be hearing what you should do if your flight was cancelled. But first, Aisha Zahid reports on the travel chaos. For thousands of passengers, the chaos continues. Across the country and around the world, the knock-on effects of yesterday's technical fault in UK air traffic control systems are being felt. In Majorca, Melanie and her son James stayed at the airport overnight, waiting to hear more on when they can fly home. It's disappointed and let down and absolutely exhausted. I've got an 11-year-old son who's had to sleep on the floor in the airport. I'm on my own with him, so yeah, it's just not ideal and just not good customer service. With more flights cancelled at UK airports, many are still miles away from their destinations with more questions than answers. We're trying to get to Peru um, we actually got married on Sunday, so this is our honeymoon. So it wasn't meant to go like this. We're waiting to have like the cancellation on our phones, so then we can book the hotel. But on our phones, it still says the flight's going, but they keep saying that the flights are cancelled, all flights are cancelled. Uh, we were hoping to be in Greece this evening. That was it. But, um, yeah, it doesn't look like it's a possibility at this minute in time. National Air Traffic Services, or NATS, fixed the glitch that caused all of this within several hours. But across airports, including Newcastle, delays piled up. For passengers waiting here and further afield, minutes turned into hours. For some, hours have turned into days. The next available flight from where we're staying back to London Gatwick isn't till Sunday, I believe. So we're trying... Yet yeah, we're trying to find an Mommy. alternative flight. Mommy. But with Mommy. two young kids, it's... Mommy. Um... While some passengers stayed at airports overnight, others were forced to book hotels, footing bills for their accommodation and food. Airlines are under pressure to step in. The airlines have a responsibility to get them home, uh, either on a new flight or on a flight with an alternative airline. And if they have to stay overnight, their airline has to pay for their accommodation and provide them with food and drink as well. Airports and airlines say they're working to resolve the backlogs. But for some, that wait will feel endless, amid warnings of more significant disruption ahead. Aisha Zahid, ITV News. Well, Callum Watkinson is live at Heathrow this lunchtime. Um, Callum, what's the situation there? Well, I've been for a look inside Terminal 5 this morning. It does support that idea that systemically things are back to normal. Uh, in departures on a board containing 87 flights, only three of them were showing as cancelled. The problem, as we've been hearing, is this backlog. The terminal was absolutely stuffed with passengers with, on, from flights that were cancelled yesterday, all trying to get on uh, planes today, many of which are already full. Now, the advice from airlines and airports up and down the country uh, is please don't come to the airport 
if your flight has been cancelled. Uh, in terms of the wider picture, though, the Civil Aviation Authority is now investigating what's happened. Uh, the government has asked them to submit a report as soon as they can. There are reports, though, uh, this lunchtime, Kylie, that an inputting error by a French airline may have uh, led to this situation. That will obviously form one of those, one of the lines of inquiry for that investigation, but it's too early to say right now. OK, Callum Watkinson, thank you. So what are your rights if you've had your flight delayed or cancelled? Well, for more on this, joining me is travel expert Paul Charles. Thanks very much for coming in this lunchtime. People may expect that they automatically go to their airline and get their money back when this happens. That might not be the case, though. No, that's true, and it depends on each case, of course. But generally, there'll be no compensation payable in this particular case because it wasn't the airline's fault. The airlines say this was the fault of Nats, who run the air traffic control software. But the airline does have to get you home if you're abroad. They have to get you on the next available flight of their own or on a rival airline's flight if they can't get you on one of their own. And at the very least, they have to offer you reasonable food and water to keep you going, to keep you sustained before you fly home. So it's that duty of care, isn't it? And we, we heard from the uh, mother there in that report who had the children in the background. We've all so, been there. Mm, um, des desperate to get home. I mean, what advice would you give to people in that situation? Well, the first thing is make sure you're listening to your airline's communications. They are getting better. They're not always great, but they're getting better at telling you in advance if your flight is cancelled or delayed. So look out for a text from your airline. Do not cancel the flight yourself. If you cancel, you're then liable for any other costs related to that booking and the airline will wash its hands of any hmm. uh, money due and then check with your travel insurance as well that may be able to pay out for any costs that you've incurred do keep your receipts uh, and any costs that you've had to lay out keep evidence of it because you may then be able to claim that back from the airline in future and is it true that if you accept maybe a hotel from from the airline or food and and vouchers then that might come off any compensation that you might be entitled to no, you basically, if you're able to show what you've incurred during the extent of the time you've been away, say out of the country, if it's four days or five days perhaps in some cases, then as long as you can show that the airline got you back over those five days, you incurred the hotel cost during that time, then they will or should pay out for it. The problem, of course, they are so overwhelmed with people contacting them at the moment during what is a busy period anyway, that you might not get refunded or any money back for some time yet. Mm. And for some people in a cost of living crisis they're having to shell out a lot of money before they'll see that money again yeah absolutely and maybe relying on their credit cards to do That's so right. we know that it can be very hard to contact airlines mm. most operate an online business now don't they yeah. but if would you recommend that you do call your airline if you're worried maybe about your flight departing over the next couple of days? I would not call the airline because you're putting more pressure on the system. I've heard stories this morning of people waiting two hours before the phone is answered. The airlines can't cope. This isn't just one airline affected. This is every airline who flew into and out of the UK yesterday. That's over 6,000 flights affected. So you can understand why there's a backlog, why customer service centres can't cope. I'd wait for the airline to contact you initially because in this day and age they should be doing that with the systems they've got in place. They won't get it right every time, there will be a lot of problems, but wait for them to contact you about how to send in your expense receipts and stuff like that. Okay, good advice. Paul, thank you very much for your time. And if your flight has been delayed or cancelled, you can find more information on our website about your rights and possible compensation. You can just head to itv.com forward slash news. Next is lunchtime. London has become the world's largest pollution charging area after the ultra low emission zone or ULES was expanded to include the whole of the capital. The scheme aimed at improving air quality charges people £12.50 a day for driving vehicles that don't meet certain emissions standards. London Mayor Sadiq Khan has faced fierce criticism of the scheme, not only challenges from councils, but also numerous protests too. Here's our political reporter, Jasmine Cameron Chileshi. For many Londoners, the everyday drive has just become more expensive. The expansion of the ULES scheme to all 32 boroughs makes London the world's biggest anti-pollution charging zone. But for residents having to pay, the policy has been controversial. Yes, the environment, um, yes, it will help people, if not now, but in the long run, 
but what does that look like in terms of impacting people now? And I think it's going to be massive with all the bills going up. I mean, I can't afford to, uh, at the moment, if I go out every day and I've had it. My money's, I only get a pension, that's it. Not very nice for us that, like, you're getting on in age and um, obviously you can't afford, you can't afford it. You, you just, and I've got to get rid of cars and vans. London Mayor Sadiq Khan says the scheme will improve air quality for millions. I'm quite clear though that although this was a difficult decision, it's the right one uh, and it's vital to our city. I think clean air is a right, not a privilege. I want those in outer London to also benefit from cleaner air. But some Conservative-led councils outside the capital have opposed, arguing more support should be given to those affected. And on a visit today, the Prime Minister agreed, arguing the £12.50 daily cost will put unnecessary financial pressure on drivers. I think people and families are struggling with the cost of living. That's obvious to everyone. And at that time, the Labour Party, the Labour Mayor, Sadiq Khan and Keir Starmer are introducing the ULES charge. Health experts say air pollution is linked to conditions such as asthma and believe the scheme will benefit London as well as neighbouring areas. So ULES I think is an important first step uh, in getting rid of the most polluting vehicles in London. It's very clear that the diesel vehicles, the older diesel vehicles were producing more particles and especially nitrogen dioxide, both of which are uh, toxic uh, and they, they needed to be removed. <laughs> In the meantime, local councils across the country and the government will be examining the effects of the scheme closely as authorities seek to balance environmental commitments with cost of living concerns. Jasmine Cameron Chaleshi, ITV News, Westminster. An inquest into the death of 10 year old Sarah Sharif has been told the cause has yet to be determined but is likely to be unnatural. Sarah's body was found at a house in Woking on August the 10th. Police in Pakistan are now widening the search for her father and two other family members who fled the UK the previous day. Pakistan's former Prime Minister Imran Khan has won a significant legal battle. An appeal court has suspended his corruption conviction and three-year prison term, but it's not yet clear if Khan will be released from prison on bail as he faces several more charges. And James Cleverley is heading to China tomorrow, the first trip there by UK Foreign Secretary in more than five years. The Foreign Office says the trip will strengthen channels of communication and protect British interests. Cleverley says China's increasing global influence comes with responsibilities. Now to the scandal involving Spain's football chief. In a major U-turn, members of the Spanish Football Association are calling for Luis Rubiales to resign after he kissed player Jenny Amoso at the Women's World Cup. He insists it was consensual. She says absolutely not. Rubiales has been defiant, refusing to step down. Meanwhile, the Spanish Women's World Cup team has threatened not to play for their country until he goes. FIFA, the world football's governing body, has provisionally suspended Rubiales. Despite this, he remains in post. Spanish prosecutors are also investigating whether the incident amounts to sexual assault, while his mother locked herself in a church and started a hunger strike in protest. Well, last night, protesters gathered in Madrid to voice their anger, and Ellie Pitt is there for us. Um, Ellie, what's the uh, fallout since this U-turn? The reality is, Kylie, that this is a sign of Luis Rubiales further losing support. On Friday, his colleagues at the Spanish Football Federation, or the FA here, were clapping and applauding his defiant speech where he said five times that he wouldn't quit. But last night, after a six-hour meeting, it seems that they've decided the reputation of the Federation comes first and they've urged him to resign over that kiss that he gave Jenny Hermoso at the end of the World Cup. Nice now the ball is back in his court as to whether he will stay and sit out the FIFA suspension and investigation or whether he will go. Certainly Lioness Ella Toon believes his position is untenable. He shouldn't be in the job anymore, I think, for the mistake that he's made. And now something like that has overshadowed how well the Spanish national team have done. They've just won a World Cup and yet all that's been spoken about is that, which is a shame. And, yeah, the right thing should definitely be done. Back in Spain, it really feels like there is mounting pressure on him to go. Last night in Madrid, there were protests in the street where women had come out and wanted to march about his actions. And while he decides whether to stay 
or go. The potential for the disruption in Spanish football is considerable. The president of the Women's League told me that while 50 players, more than 50 players, uh, are refusing to play for the national side while he's still in position. What happens when they're due to play in a couple of weeks' time at the international break is definitely still unclear. Ellie Pitts in Madrid, thank you very much. Still to come this lunchtime, ripping up environmental rules to build new homes. Campaign groups say it will damage our waterways. And the stuff of nightmares, the worm that was living in a woman's brain for two months. But first, more people are dying in Scotland of alcohol-related issues than at any time in the past 14 years. New figures released today show 1,276 people died as a result of alcohol last year. That's the highest figure since 2008, with the people in the poorest areas four times more likely to be affected. Well, Louise Scott is in Glasgow for us. So, Louise, worrying figures for Scotland. It really is, Kylie. This time last week, we were hearing that drug-related deaths in Scotland last year had decreased by 20%. That seemed like a step in the right direction for Scotland's long-standing struggle with substance abuse. But today, a stark reminder that it's not just drugs that are the issue. Alcohol-related deaths last year were actually higher. Now, minimum unit pricing was introduced in Scotland in 2018. That added 50 pence for every unit of alcohol in a drink. The idea to decrease the sales of cheap drink that had high al alcohol content. It's been deemed generally as a success, but I asked the Scottish Government how that could be if deaths are still on the rise. I think the Public Health Scotland um, report and evaluation of minimum unit pricing um, shows us that it's estimated to have saved hundreds of lives every year. So I think that we have to recognise that those deaths might have even been higher had we not had minimum unit pricing in place. But it's only right that we do a full and thorough evaluation of, of minimum unit pricing and decide um, how that's going to continue in the future. Well, charities involved in the recovery sector say these figures are unacceptable and they believe the Scottish Government has taken the eye off the ball when it comes to alcohol to focus on those drugs deaths. They are asking the Scottish Government to increase the minimum unit pricing next year from 50 pence to 65 pence and combat the reduction there has been in access to alcohol services over the past decade. Louise Scott, thank you very much. The government has been accused of ripping up pollution rules in order to allow more houses to be built. Ministers have scrapped an EU rule that regulated the amount of chemicals allowed to flow into rivers from new developments. Up to 100,000 new homes could be built by 2030. Well, our science correspondent Martin Stewart is in Winchester for us this lunchtime. So, Martin, this has caused quite a bit of controversy. Absolutely. We've got friction here between the need to build new houses, which lowers prices and improves the housing stock, and the need to protect the environment. What the government says is they've been missing housing targets for a long time because there's too much red tape. One bit of red tape was introduced in 2017 when we were still in the EU, and that means that house developers aren't allowed to release nutrients into waterways uh, from things like wastewater because that can make the rivers go green and potentially lose oxygen and maybe fish could even die. But developers are being scared off because they're having to pay huge sums of money. So what the government says it's going to do is row back on that policy and invest money elsewhere. They say that that will more than offset any pollution. They say will be small amounts working its way into the river. But needless to say, environmental campaigners are not happy about this at all. Allowing polluters to go ahead and increase the toxic burden on our waterways in the promise of some long-term hope of increasing protection and pollution reduction elsewhere. That's simply not acceptable in a world where only 14% of our rivers meet good condition. Now, the government says that this is the right thing to do. It'll stimulate the economy and that they are, as I said, mitigating any environmental impacts. But we know that there is a lot of political pressure. People don't like the fact that sewage and nutrients are ending up in our waterways and in the sea. So it is a big issue which continually will run for a little bit longer too. Yeah, indeed. OK, uh, Martin Stewart in Winchester, thank you very much. Just a warning for you, if you're having your lunch, you might not like the next story. 
We know that neurosurgeons are no strangers to unexpected problems. The brain is, of course, the most complex organ in the body after all. But a team of doctors from Australia were left stunned when they spotted something alive and wriggling inside the head of a patient. The woman had been suffering a whole host of symptoms, but no one could have thought that they were caused by an eight centimetre worm. Nick Wallace takes up the story. Eight centimetres long, red and pulled alive from an Australian woman's brain. I dissected around the abnormal area that you could see on the scan. I thought, gosh, that feels funny. You couldn't see anything more abnormal. And then I was able to really feel something separate. I took my tweezers or my tumour holding forceps and I pulled it out and I thought, gosh, what is that? It's moving. Take it out of my hands. The patient, who hasn't been identified, had been complaining of diarrhoea, fever and night sweats for two years. In the last 12 months, that escalated to forgetfulness and depression. After seeing the brain scan, Dr Bandy went in to have a look. It was definitely not what we were expecting. Everyone was shocked and the worm that we found was happily moving quite vigorously outside of the brain. Carpet pythons are the usual host for this type of worm. These snakes are largely harmless to humans, though this huge specimen recently captured on camera shows just how big they can grow. The worm's eggs can be found in python feces, and it's thought the woman may have inadvertently consumed the parasite's eggs on food she'd foraged. For many months she'd been really struggling, and it was really courageous of her to come and have further testing after not having answers for so very long. But she did really well for knowing what was actually causing all her trouble, and then having now treatment for what was causing the trouble. It's the first time in medical history a parasite of this kind has been found inside a human being. Nick Wallace, ITV News. You couldn't make it up, could you? You know it's spectacular when even a neurosurgeon is surprised. Well, that's it from us this lunchtime. The latest where you are is next, uh, followed by the weather. Yamal Fambale is here with the evening news at 6.30. But from all of us here, whatever you're doing, enjoy your afternoon. Bye for now.